Hello, everyone. So this is the final session uh, before uh, the Friday night. So hopefully, uh, since you guys are here, on the, uh, not going to having a party yet, so I, we appreciate it first. So hopefully, this session will help you for each one of you in different manners. So, so today, we have a fabulous panel, panelist here because uh, the, we have a common the, these, uh, the subject, we're going to talk about NFT, we're going to talk about gaming, we talk about play to earn, uh, but everyone has very different expertise from different uh, projects, so they might give you a lot of different components for you to make a great decision on whatever you do. So let's start from a quick intro. Uh, we have a lot of several uh, detailed uh, follow-up based upon your experience, so make it quick, but let's start from GD. Uh, hi, hi everyone. Uh, I'm GD from uh, Unopen. So we are build, I'm, I'm supporting our teams, uh, pro projects in Korea, building up Web3 Gaming. Hi everybody. Uh, I'm HQ Han. I'm the Web3 growth lead for Filecoin. Um, so my team focuses on driving the adoption of Filecoin in the Web3 space. And we are focused on three main verticals, NFTs, games, and the metaverse. And uh, particular for the NFT and gaming space, I think many of you may be more familiar with NFT.storage or Web3.storage. These are storage services that make Filecoin like, super easy to use. Um, yeah, so yeah, happy to be here. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Andy Chow. I'm head of ecosystem development for YGG. So YGG is a play to earn uh, gaming guild that is just bringing a lot of players into the metaverse, into blockchain based economies. And uh, yeah, happy to be here as well. Yeah, I'm Matt Sorg. I head product and tech for the uh, Solana Foundation, which you can essentially think of as the ecosystem around uh, Solana. So the, the apps and the validators, RPCs, all those kind of tools. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, we'll have a team that kind of help accelerate the ecosystem. Great. So maybe some of you guys uh, who are not familiar with each project here, so they might be a little confused. So what these guys are doing with the NFT. So let's uh, actually, uh, before uh, handing over to these people, so if I have put the one word, so GD is basically incubator for a lot of uh, crypto gaming projects. And HQ here is basically working on infrastructure that NFT gaming peop uh, projects are utilizing. And then the ND here is uh, the one of the most leading gaming guild in crypto space. And then he's in charge of subtile management. So he can provide a lot of insight on that. And then the Matt there is one of the leading layer one solution called the Solana. And then he's doing a lot of strategy and partnership in addition to his various experience in traditional web two gaming company. Uh, I think I already said it, so maybe we don't have to go, go each. So, Go to, go, to, go to a specific question. Uh, so I'll ask a specific question for each of them so you guys can provide uh, some specialty. So let's start with um, GD here. So GD works for the Hashed Gaming Venture Arm. So he's doing a lot of uh, incubation, which includes the token launch strategy and such. So for you, uh, what kind of interaction you have with the NFT projects and then how you actually add value as an incubator for those NFT projects? So first of all, you know, there's a lot of good developers in this, and then for this, particularly for the gaming, a lot of like, there's a lot of good gaming, gaming designers in the traditional gaming area. So uh, we've done a lot of meetings uh, since August. So we established this company like last August and last year. And now like, I mean, we already have three gaming projects at this point. So that's how, like, we meet, we meet all the developers and then like we teach like the Web3 components, like, you know, how to, to teach them how to build the token economy and how to utilize NFT and how to put, put them in the gaming. So, and those kind of like education, uh, educations are the, the ones that we are pro providing to Web2 de developers. And then uh, they come up with their expertise. So uh, we find the synergy there uh, and then build the projects. Thank you. Let's go to Matt uh, from Solana. So Solana is without doubt one of the leading uh, layer one at the moment. So I think uh, Solana uh, has a lot of involvement with the gaming project. So Matt, my question to you will be, first of all, what's your kind of uh, NFT exposure as a Solana member? What do you do with this, uh, this, whatever NFT project you are interact with? 
The second question will be, uh, in, in a gaming space, there is a big trend that Web2 gaming company coming to Web3. And then the, the Matt right there is, uh, he worked at the Riot Games, known for League of, uh, League of Legends, and also worked at Unity, which is the, the, one of the two top gaming engine that all Web2 gaming company is, have to rely on. So my second question to you is, uh, what's your kind of uh, view as uh, someone who knows the traditional gaming world and when you interact with the NFT projects that you wanted to partner with? Yeah, so the first uh, part of that, we're pretty agnostic. Anybody who's legitimately building uh, an experience on Solana, I try to help them out where I can. I mean, I, I have a limited time in my day, <laughs> so I have to do make some, some distinctions. But uh, in general, we try not to be prescriptive because it's a very nascent space, and I don't think anybody's really discovered exactly uh, what the user's going to really, really want here. And I don't claim, I have certainly my own opinions about what's going to be successful and what, you know, from first principles kind of makes sense and what doesn't. I, but I definitely don't want to be the bottleneck to creativity. And so that's why you kind of see a pretty diverse set of games being uh, launched on Solana. Uh, and I think that actually kind of leads pretty naturally into your second point, where I think Web 2 games. Uh, they have the, their specific models, and the, in Web2 kind of, and just in general in games, uh, they, they take the, something that works and try to plug, it, pl plug and play it with the, the next game, and I think you're seeing that a lot with kind of Axie Infinity, where you're trying to then plug and play that in the next game, but I, I think one of the things I'm really excited about is uh, games thinking outside of that, uh, and I think that's what I think a lot of the Web2 games are waiting for. They don't really understand these uh, you know, mint models that uh, don't really have an obvious like inflow and outflow of their consumer because they're always used to just taking money in. And if the other model is only yielding tokens, that doesn't make sense to them. And it also, yeah, honestly, the sustainability is always obviously in question anyway. Um, so I think they have to get over that barrier. And then they also, I think the, the one of their challenges is they already have all these systems in place that Web3 can replace. So they already have subscriptions and loyalty programs and payment systems set up all around the world. So they can't quite make use of something as well as a, an independent, independent developer. So like Stepin, for example, all they have to do is mint NFTs and fungible tokens on Solana and they get liquidity around the world. They didn't have to set up the payment rails, that was just them minting tokens. But the Web2 company that's already really well established wouldn't get that efficiency. So they really have to, their bar for what is really added by the blockchain is much higher and so they really have to have that creativity, um, which is a much longer conversation and it really is very much about their specific game. Thank you. Um, so next I want to go to HQ. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, in, in crypto space, especially gaming we are talking about, uh, there are a lot of infrastructure that we need for, to make this uh, NFT gaming for the mainstream adoption. So, I think what Filecoin that HQ works for provides a critical infrastructure for many NFT gaming projects. So, HQ, can you explain to the audience what the Filecoin does for NFT gaming? And then the second follow-up question will be, uh, what is some other infrastructure in, in the NFT gaming space you think, is, is, even if the Filecoin is not providing, what are the other kind of missing components you think there is? Because the HQ basically look for the, all the NFT infrastructure even outside of Filecoin. Yeah, um, I can probably answer like both questions kind of like at the same time. Um, so as, as Steve mentioned, um, I think if we take a step back, um, you know, we are probably more familiar with the Web2 gaming infrastructure. And if you kind of think of it as like, let's just say like several layers built on top of each other. So you have like asset creation, then you have like the game engines like uh, Unreal and Unity, for example, and then you have like your cloud cloud infrastructure. Uh, and then after that, you have distribution and then maybe things on top like, you know, uh, payments or, you know, live ops, that kind of thing. And so when we take this infrastructure model and we look at like Web3, um, we can sort of like insert blockchain specific things inside. So for example, the blockchain specific thing would be, um, you know, like as Matt mentioned, you know, um, your digital assets, they're usually stored store on a, you know, like issued via like a blockchain, um, your token issuance as well and your 
kind of like in-game DeFi, for example, and then the highest layer, your, your payments, you know, and your distribution and your wallet infrastructure, that's also quite different and it's more like Web3 native. Um, yeah, so that's the current state of affairs right now. Um, so when we look at Web3 gaming, actually the state of affairs is that the game actually does their gameplay and their game state on centralized AWS servers, and then the digital assets and so forth are actually done in the decentralized space. So when we, so for example, like Filecoin, um, we actually like the default storage layer for the de decentralized space. So where we actually come in is that these digital assets are actually stored on decentralized storage and hence Filecoin. So we are in a position whereby we can see trends that are happening um, in terms of digital assets. So for example, like um, NFT.storage and Web3.storage, we, in a year we've seen like 100 million uploads. Um, 80,000 unique users, for example, and it's still a very strong growth trend uh, through the bear market. Um, and so, like, the second question that Steve asked was about, like, you know, what else is there to be done? And the truth is that the Web3 stack is still very, is really, like, evolving. It's really changing. So on the Filecoin side, we are, you know, like, interested to build infrastructure that can power like billions of digital assets. Um, we are working on two main updates. The first is on the retrieval side of things. So we are aiming for CDN quality retrieval, um, you know, meaning that you can retrieve things in like less than one second. Um, so a main net version of that is going to be launched in the first half of next year. And then the second thing that I'm really excited about is like uh, smart contracts are launching on Filecoin towards the end of the year. So the Filecoin virtual machine is going to enable like all sorts of applications. And when you play that back to like the infrastructure stack, uh, potentially, I don't know, like in the next couple of years, like maybe you can use Filecoin um, as your cloud infrastructure instead of AWS. Thank you. For those who are a little bit confused, so basically the Filecoin, uh, is NFT can be, is a lot of NFT, you know, is stored in the centralized storage, which is not truly decentralized manner. But Filecoin basically provide the NFT itself is stored in decentralized manner. Uh, yeah. So going to Andy, of course, you know, it's, it's your turn. So Andy works for the uh, YGG, Yield Guild Games, and then uh, with his uh, extensive uh, experience in banking, uh, IBD banking, uh, but he's now working for expanding the YGG in a manner that he's managing SubDAO. So my question here will be, first is more YG specific to, second is not. So first YG uh, specific is, so what is meaning by SubDAO? To, to YGG. Second is, wh how do you, what do you mean by managing it? Because uh, DAO is always very invisible, especially even for me invisible, but I think for the non-crypto people even more invisible. So I think it's good to clarify a little bit. And then actually the real second question will be, oh, um, a lot is a more DAO question, because I think you should know more about DAO than I am. So a lot of skepticism on DAO. Uh, because it, there was a, some boom about DAO last year, but sudden, suddenly it's gone. So what's your view about the DAO in general? All right, I'll, I guess I'll start with the first, right? Uh, second one seems a bit more difficult. Um, but uh, so I'll, I'll, to take a step back here, YGG, like what we saw maybe around the Axie boom was that there was a way to sort of aggregate a lot of the NFT assets in these blockchain games and be able to rent them out to players and what we call scholars. So we offer these scholarships um, first starting in the Philippines and a lot of what I do is expanding out into the other different regions. And so taking that model and diversifying not just maybe just in Axie itself but in a lot of other blockchain games is basically what we're, we're, we're doing here and it's bringing a lot of you know, people maybe from emerging countries into Web3. Um, to your question about sub DAOs, um, so you can't think of it like a subsidiary, you can't think of it like you know, a franchise model or something like that. What we're really trying to do is um, have some layer of decentralization here, some autonomy for a lot of these different regions. So, you know, for example, we set up a sub DAO for Southeast Asia called YGG Southeast Asia, uh, partnered with some local partners, uh, IVC actually, Infinity Ventured Crypto. For India, we, we worked with Polygon to build up IndieGG. 
Uh, we have one in Latin America, OLGG, just started YG Japan, and actually Korea will be will be starting, uh, and, and more of this will be announced later, but around, um, uh, it'll be eSports sort of focused sub DAO. It's called SkyGG, so South Korea YGG. Um, to your question about, so like, I would say it's not really managing. We're not really command control type of system. We're more like um, managing the relationships across all these different regions. And the reason for that is I think it's really important that the local regions have their autonomy. They, they know which games to invest in best. They know which, they know how to best use their treasuries and things like that. Um, of course, we'll offer our support. And I think a lot of that comes with the, you know, with the setup. Um, for example, you know, when I first joined, a lot of it was like, okay, how can we mirror some of these, org like, how can we mirror our org structure with some of the other ones? So, for example, having like a game asset acquisition team, and then having a community lead, having game operations. So a lot of these things that we sort of were able to solve, um, you know, last year, uh, starting from the Philippines, uh, we're trying to bring that across to the different regions. Um, yeah. All right. Sounds good. So let's uh, step back a little bit. By the way, we have 26 minutes more, so we have plenty of time. Let's step back a little bit. So do, for those who are, might be interested in gaming specifically, so this question might go to Matt and the GD here first. So uh, to the Matt, uh, a common question will be, what, what's your view on NFT game, your particular view? Uh, that's something that I want to hear. Uh, and then second question will be, um, uh, yeah, that's the question. So I'll, I'll share a little bit of myself. So my view on NFT gaming is there are a few trends, but, but uh, one of the uh, two trends that I, I realize is, again, Web2 companies trying to get in Web3. And then it seems like uh, we've been seeing a lot of play to earn model for a while, but I start to see the free to play and then NFT on top of it. So that's the kind of new model I'm looking at because a lot of Web2 game developers are familiar with the free-to-play model more, and then they believe that they can build a fun game, not about the like, a free token model kind of stuff. So those are the two things that I'm looking at. And then also third part is a, a lot of uh, global IP companies are using their global IP to make it as a blockchain game. Those are the kind of trend I'm seeing, but I, I wanna wonder uh, what you guys see. Yeah, the, the main thing I see is Blockchain is a way that you, similar to Roblox or Rec Room or all these UGC platforms, you can use your community to build with you. So, especially on an ecosystem like Solana that scales uh, in a connected way, uh, if, I'm, if I mint my NFTs or you know, execute my strategy, whatever way it is, either upfront or through uh, earned in-game, uh, all of a sudden my players have access to marketplaces, they have access to uh, renting, lending, community events, so I can, my players can have uh, tournaments and they can have certified like, what the reward is from the tournament, maybe there's a buy-in for the tournament, maybe it's just a fun event that somebody donates the, the reward, but that's an, actually an in-game item now. That's hard to do in Web2. Uh, there's not the, the, or at the very least, the game would have to produce it itself in order for that to work in Web2. Uh, and so you all of a sudden have all these things that your community can build with you in Web3 that the game maker doesn't have to specifically build themselves. And, the, and this is really powerful because the community itself is deciding what they found fun and where they want to put their, their you know, efforts and which tools in the ecosystem they want to they value. So that's, like, that's why I'm really excited about it because you're actually getting these ecosystems effects. Um, and I think that's really what can be competitive with these closed ecosystems where the Web2 teams are you know, controlling all the data and they, they're trying to harvest that as much as possible. Uh, and that is powerful. You, know, you, can, you can really craft experiences if you really understand your users to that level. Um, but the Web3 view is that if the, you know, there's some self-selection and there's all these other you know, network effects, that can be even more powerful. And that's like kind of the bit of the battle I see. Uh, first of all, I think, you know, like in the near future, uh, a lot of gamers will mostly talk about like their items and their, and their NFTs rather than like, rather than art. So I, I pretty much agree to Steve's point, like, you know, like, like six months ago, we were excited about play to earn, but now it's more like it's gone, right? So I think a lot of gamers will think about 
owning the specific items, and then they'll think, I mean, play a specific game for 10 years, and then they'll, they'll put their meanings on, on their NFTs. So game, game companies, they'll have to think about how to treat all their games, uh, and, you know, how, how to treat their uh, gamers. And, the, and then the second thing is that it's a commu community. So when, in, when it comes to the Web2 gamings, you know, a lot of community, a lot of gamers, they shouted out, shouted out to the game, uh, to, to developers, but most of them were ignored. So, but NFT holders, token holders, like all the communities, they can, they can shout out to the developers and, and, and then the games, and then they can even vote in the DAO. So it's gonna be told, the scene, the, the scene's gonna be totally changed. And the third thing, I, I, the third point that I wanna make is that the Web3 uh, gaming studios now have to compete with uh, the Web2, like the big IPs, uh, and then in terms of quality, and then the in, terms, in, in terms of a core value. So when, when I'm saying core value here is, is fun itself. So it's gonna be uh, really interesting to see how a new players coming in and then rise. And personally, I, I believe that in the next 10 years, uh, you'll see new names in the top 10 of gaming uh, industry. Okay, then this naturally goes, uh, I think goes to Andy, because uh, Andy's YGG is largely, portfolio is, depends on play to earn model at the moment. But there is a, some, you know, uh, the, the model has been outdated, it should be renovated, uh, so innovated, uh, there's a, some a lot of arguments. So my question to you is, what's your view on you know, plea to on is getting way out, and what's the YGG seeing, or what YGG community is trying to innovate from classic play to earn to next level? And then to HQ's question, uh, HQ, I think HQ is in charge of ecosystem growth in Asia. So she's based in Singapore, and she's in charge of Asia expansion for US company, uh, US Western company, Firecoin. So my question to you is, what do you mean, uh, what do you mean to you about ecosystem growth? So how, what kind of thing that do you do to make the, your ecosystem, whether Filecoin or your project you're working with, or especially if it's a gaming project, that would be nicer, uh, NFT projects. Um, so let's go to Andy, who's thinking very hard. No, yeah, it's, a, it's, a very, it's a very good point. Um, and I think that, you know, the model has gone from well, I guess play to earn is really quite new itself. We're really early in this space, right? And it's yet proven not, I mean, it's, it's, it was, a lot of it was proven out last year, but you know, how sustainable is that over time, right? And so I think that's, that's, been, um, that's been like what we've been thinking a lot about at YGG and maybe how that changes maybe from play to earn, but maybe from play to earn to play and earn. And so having more of a fun factor in, in some of these games, um, you know, when I started, like, the vast majority of, like, us and our sub DAOs were playing Axie, right? But over time, we've diversified. Uh, if you combine all of us together, it's almost about 20 active games now. And so from there, and there's a lot more that we're getting into that still haven't launched yet. And from there, is there going to be a play and earn a, or more of a fun factor to these games? I think that's point number one. Point number two is there is going to be, I think, more and more uh, talk about not just play or, or play to earn or play whatever earn, but like X to earn, right? And so this is something that we're definitely looking at right now, which is like, you know, we've invested in this uh, company called Walk-In and, and, you know, this is a walk to earn. Uh, there's Stepin, obviously, there's other move to earn type of projects. There's sing to earn, there's learn to earn, uh, create to earn. And so we're like, a lot of this stuff is really quite new. And so I think, you know, both from a fun factor and from like a X to earn type of standpoint, I think that's kind of where we're evolving to. Yeah. Excuse me, my question. If my question is a little, uh, no, uh, kind it's of, uh, okay. okay. Yeah, yeah, I can deal with it. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So maybe I can talk a bit about like ecosystem growth, and I think that is like actually really, really relevant to all the concepts that we are talking about. So, I think in general, um, you know, like when we look at an ecosystem, what you usually do is like okay. Yeah, all the stakeholder segments, and then you have like a dedicated strategy for each stakeholder segment. So if we take the play-to-earn model, I think it's definitely a lot more complex. You know, like a lot of everyone's talking about sustainability. So, you know, when you start a Web three game, you you have you have like your game economy, and then you have open economy. So you have 
three groups of people, like investors, um, players, and earners, right? which actually makes it a lot more complex, which is why we are at a stage whereby um, people have tried to deal with the game economy and the open economy, but then there's a lot of questions around sustainability. So, you know, going back to the first principles of ecosystem growth, it's just a lot more complex because you're dealing with three different kinds of stakeholders. Um, and, you know, back to like Andy's point, um, something that I've been thinking about, and I think like people in my company and project as well, um, is that we, we actually did a user research study recently um, on you know, pain points, uh, needs of people in the metaverse. Um, and, you know, this, this report is going to be published very soon. Um, what we learned from the users, you know, in the metaverse right now is that they actually don't want the play to earn mechanics to go into a metaverse platform. And this is because, like, in a metaverse, you know, for example, like a complex virtual environment, um, what they really found, you know, that draw them to the metaverse is the social interactions. So they actually don't like these earner segments of people where they are like earning and then leaving. So earn to leave. And then so like we, we were, you know, recently discussing about like, okay, how can you actually build in social, uh, social things for this group of segment, like these earners people, such that they become a bit more sticky. Like they are coming not just to earn and leave and therefore like, you know, um, basically um, churn a lot and affect your game economy eventually. Um, you know, how can you actually like build all these like social interactions? And I think that's a really important question that play to earn, you know, needs to like look at when they look at their entire ecosystem. Yeah. Great. So uh, my next question will be to everyone. Uh, when you work with your partners, I mean, in the Solana case, I think you're head of a product, so whether investment target or your partner and such, what, do you, what are you looking for the most? Or what the other p p people pitching to you usually often missing that you are looking for, but they are pitching? So it's more like advice for your partners if we want to work with you. Uh, same for the, I mean, YGG, if you are not directly involved, what kind of a talent or the counter games that you are investing partner, what YGG as a firm looking for? And then also the same to HQ, what kind of things you're looking for? And then as an incubator, what kind of company you want to incubate? So start from Matt. I think really it's pretty simple. If somebody comes to me understanding their product and how blockchain could really accelerate some aspect of it and really uh, enhance the user experience with it, that's what I can get kind of excited about. And if they have something new that is really in tune to their product, I'm not gonna know as much about their product as they will. And if they can kind of teach me a bit about that and they can kind of show me something new, I think that's what really excites me. Uh, I get, I'll, I'll, again, I'll help anybody who's uh, authentically building on, on Solana. And there's definitely people who come into the room and, and just are interested in, you know, getting liquidity or, or, or various other things. But I think if you're, you're doing that, then there's, there's a lot of, there's gonna be a lot of barriers for you. Uh, this isn't, this is very different than saying that the, uh, the first group will know every single part of their Web3 strategy. It's, there's, just, there's just a lot of things that are new that they're not gonna know every single thing about it, and that's kind of my role, is they have this inkling of where blockchain can really help them out. Uh, and that's where I'm excited to help them through all the steps to, to have them ship their, their new idea. Just FYI, the Matt is actually 2x exit entrepreneur before the crypto. And then he actually they built the crypto game back in 2017. One of them was a zero dollar exit, let's be clear. <laughs> but yeah, so please consider his advice seriously. So let's go to Andy. All right, uh, I'll, take, I'll take a version of that uh, uh, with, the, with the question that you asked. Um, so I would say on the gaming side, we actually do have a team that's totally focused just on the asset acquisition there, which is, you know, investing in these games, maybe looking at the in-game in NFT assets. Uh, they definitely look at what the sort of like making sure that this sort of a robust sort of token economy, right? Um, still hasn't proven out all the sustainability, you know, as we've just been talking about. But, um, you know, over time, they've been learning much more about how these, you know, this, this kind of works. 
And then I would say, you know, there's also things around looking at does this actually work in our guild model, right? Does it work for a scholarship type model? So these are things that we do look for when we're looking at different games. Also, you know, making sure that like it's a, it's a just a really you know high quality project. Uh, recently, we we just got into a um, a game called My Pet Hooligan, and so that that's something that we were really excited about as some of these like creators and and the people behind it were actually folks that were animating like uh, Toy Story and things. So a lot of this is, is, is quite exciting on the game side. I'd say from the sub down side on like the international expansions piece, um, a lot of what I'm looking for is like, what, like, what the, do the teams look like, um, you know, to kind of steward these sub DAOs into the right direction. Um, are they, does, you know, right now there's sort of a barbell strategy is how we're looking about expanding. It's not so much like, uh, just one single way, which is, you know, before maybe in the beginning, it was more like, how can we see how these emerging markets all work? But as we, as we go more into, you know, play and earn and maybe not so, and think more about the sustainability, can, you know, for example, in Korea, can we do a sub down that's maybe more focused on esports? And it's in, or, or in Japan, it's a lot with the gaming IP, right? And so looking at those different models um, uh, as a expansion strategy, I think it's gonna help everyone else in the network as well, too. So. Awesome. Mm, yeah, I think Matt and Andy covered a lot of things. And like, um, I think maybe I can touch on like two points that I think are really important, um, given that we actually, you know, like mentor and put through the accelerator program several NFT gaming and metaverse projects every year. Um, I think the first point is that Maybe, maybe all of you guys have heard it before, but I think that um, focusing on the user and solving like a really clear pain point is something that is like incredibly obvious, but it's not something that we see quite a lot given that is, is, you know, the space is very distracting. So I think that keeping in mind that like enduring companies in any industry, you know, they always have a very clear sense of the North Star and who, you know, who they're actually building for, what value they are trying to bring. So in the case of like, for example, play to earn, um, you know, like actually you should be building for the player and who is a player, a player is somebody that plays, you know, derives incredible satisfaction from a very strong gameplay. So I think that's really something that's really important. I think the second thing is around like creativity. So we actually seen I mean, we, you know, through, through sort of like the, all the programs and hackathons that we run, we see a lot of NFT and gaming projects. And I will say that we are kind of at the cups of like exhausting and saturating the pipeline with collectibles and PFP kind of like NFT projects. So what really excites us these days are, you know, like the new kinds of like utility that you can do with NFTs. Um, I think there is like an emerging trend around like the 5G, physical and digital kind of like mix, something like a digital twin that we are seeing in terms of like consumer goods. So for example, like what Nike did with Artifact where you have a digital sneaker and then you can like forge it into real life and you can have like these two things so that your digital life and your physical life actually comes together and you can wear it in the digital world and like you can wear it in the physical world as well. Um, I think the possibilities in that realm in the consumer goods are something that goes beyond what we've seen in the NFT space and maybe can, you know, be the beginning of like a new wave um, of the possibilities of the technology. Yeah. Uh, from a developer or incubator's perspective, I mean, we really hi highly, uh, we highly value uh, the ones who've actually developed and serviced a long lasting game because uh, MMORPGs, like, you know, the long, la uh, long lasting MMORPGs pretty much have similar eco economy as the metaverse economy that we are like mentioning in, in this space. So uh, th there's a lot of lessons that we can learn from it. And then especially, you know, you know when we think of the like, token economy has to be sustainable. And of course, like, you know, there's a lot of like stakeholders inside. So, and all the lessons from the like long lasting games are very, very meaningful from, uh, to us. And then we learned a lot from, from us. And there are people actually, they really com contributed a lot to the to this, uh, to our projects. So, uh, if I mention some games like World of War Warcraft or Maple Story, Uncharted Water Online, those games are very helpful to understand the, uh, the, future, the future economy of Metaverse. Awesome. 
Uh, next uh, is a quick answer, not a long answer. So what's the subsector, as an NFT subsector, other than your own, you are excited about? Quickly, like um, quick means it's short. What kind of NFT subsector outside of your work you are excited about from GD? Um, I mean, to be honest, like short. Sure. Okay. Uh, membership NFT. Uh, yeah. Yes. I wonder how it's gonna be. Yeah. Yeah, I think. I mean, I was gonna say something like that, um, but like ticketing sure. and those kind of stuff. But then, okay, maybe I want to say something else, which is that. I think, like Matt talked about it, there's something there for like community and the roadmap of like what happens when you start as an NFT project and then what you can offer to your community because you have a stronghold of people that really love the art. Mm. So I think that, that part, there's definitely something there for, for mm. me. Awesome, creative. I think for me, it might be governance, like NFTs. Like how does that actually all work? Um, you know, we've been, th you know, as you said, DAOs are, you know, it, it's still it's still early, and we're still figuring a lot out. How do you sort of, you know, organize groups of people, and doing that through sort of, you know, this governance uh, NFT or, or or such would be really interesting. Yeah. Uh, I I do anything in the ecosystem, so there's not really a thing I'm like outside of. But there's something that I think hasn't really caught on yet that I'm super interested in, which is. So today I walk around the internet and I have all these cookies that go with me and Facebook pixels and everything that follow me around. I kind of like the idea of this next phase where I, I, every day I get to choose which NFTs I'm kind of representing as my identity that day. And so I can kind of choose how I, I represent myself online and then the sites can kind of choose how to interact with me. So if I'm wearing like a D God and a board ape that day that I might be treated some differently than if I'm having like game NFTs that I'm representing. Great, great answer. Um, for me, I'm very interested in on IP, uh, the IP kind of uh, connecting with the NFT. So at the moment, IP is IP that after IP is established, uh, the readers or users cannot do anything or cannot benefit anything. But what if you can participate in that IP from very early days? If you are part of the Harry Potter, the noble, when they, she just finished the first book, and then if you are loyalty, if you own the portion of it, what, what if you can get some revenue out of it when Harry Potter become a big? So that's something that I'm very excited about. Can I elaborate my answer once more? Sure. All right. So uh, when I meant by membership NFT, I was more uh, talking about the loyalty program NFTs. So I mean, you see a lot of loyalty program from uh, in the Web2 area, and I'm pretty much uh, excited to see all the like airlines, like restaurants, and all the like franchise. Uh, uh, tra tra uh, changing their loyalty program to Web3 and then putting all the NFCs there. I mean, it's going to be really fun. Awesome. So I think five minutes. So maybe one last question. If we have a time, then hopefully we can get some Q&A from the, from the crowd. So last question will be, so everyone here is actually from Web2 somehow. So, and then um, the Matt, he worked at Riot Games, Unity, and then the own AI startup and then came to crypto. And then Andy worked at tech uh, banking in San Francisco and then came to crypto. And then HQ, who, who worked at my same company, he worked at Goldman uh, for uh, years in Singapore and came to crypto. And then uh, GD worked at the Bain, 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 Bain consulting firm and then came to this industry. So my question to you all is maybe some of uh, audience here might be hesitant. Oh, I want to get in crypto, but maybe am I taking too much risk? I have a good job right now. Should I get in? So a lot of uh, a lot of uh, you know, uh, kind of um, situation. So maybe for those crowd, if you say one thing, what would you say? We should be still bullish or optimistic in this bear market. Start from HQ. Yeah, um, I have a lot of thoughts about this, but I I like my mind floats to actually I saw this tweet from like Ryan Selkis from Masari and. He said that he posted this tweet, like, you know, during the bear market when, like, you know, things were collapsing. And he said that, look at the innovation behind what has happened in the past few years, right? And these inventions are not going to be uninvented, even though the token, you know, token price aside and the volatility. And I thought that that was, I mean, that really, like, resonated with me because, like, um, at the end of the day, like, it's a really long journey. And I think there's, like, a saying that, like, the 
pace of change is longer than you can predict, but then the scale of the change will be much deeper than you can imagine. And so like personally, I think that's what really drives me. And I think it's worth a thought, you know, to be at the frontier of change um, as opposed to maybe having, you know, the rug pulled from you in terms of like traditional ways of doing something. Yeah. Let's go to Matt. A little shorter, please. Well, I first want to recognize that there's legitimate risks. I mean, there was a wallet in the Solana ecosystem this week that was, that in plain text had logs of people's private keys that people could just see. So it, it's, there are legitimate risks in the ecosystem. You know, the, the protocols can't do anything against that. The, 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 the keys are going to correctly sign. So there's all these consumer protections and other things that are, are very real uh, and very, you know, uh, impactful, but I, I, I think of it kind of similar to the internet and especially like email in two, two, you know, 1999 or something like that, where people are getting scammed or people are uh, clicking on bad links and it's breaking their computers. Uh, those systems have gotten hardened and hardened and hardened over time. And I think our current alternatives, like why I brought my passport out, if I and to prove my identity, I have to give everybody my address as well. You know, I have to give my birthday. I have to give literally everything about me just to, to prove who I am. Uh, not literally everything, but you know, just way too much information for that. And that is the alternative we have today. And so I think as an industry, we have the opportunity to greatly improve that. So that opportunity is the reason to, to, to come in. Andy? Yeah, I'll keep this short. A couple, couple of points. One is, I think, talent. Uh, you know, I've moved from Web 2 to Web 3, and the number of people from Web 2 asking me about what's going on in Web 3 is just becoming more and more. So that's, that's been really interesting. Uh, two, I would say, um, you know, the world's just becoming more and more digital. Like having ownership in digital economies is just gonna, it's just sort of the way I think that a lot of this is gonna move and, it, and, 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 and that's been sort of shown over the last, you know, couple years with the pandemic and lockdowns and things, right? So I really think that's, that's gonna be super interesting. Uh, for me, it was mainly like, you know, to be on the forefront of something as opposed to having, having seen, you know, more, maybe more mature industries. Uh, it's just a lot more exciting for from, from myself, yeah. When we recall, recall uh, like the last 20 years, we've seen like two uh, innovations. Like the first one came at early, 20, uh, to the early 2000s. Like everyone was using the computers. And then early 20, uh, 2010s, uh, we, all, we all started to use uh, smartphones, right? Like when I recall my back back days in like 2010s, so I didn't actually use this like smart uh, the smartphones like payment system because like I thought I I, I might do a mistake, maybe I, I might pay more than that I expected. But now we all use uh, we all pay through phone smart your smartphones. We even you you even pay your utilities and so on. So imagine what would happen in 10, 10 years uh, with this amazing uh, people and then huge capital, and then amazing infrastructure. Uh, I mean, I guess this is the last time you, you should join to this industry. Awesome, so I think this wraps up nicely. Uh, so this is end of session. If you wanna talk to one of the top layer one uh, that you wanna work with, talk to, talk to uh, grab the mat after this. And then if you are thinking about Gaming Guild and DAO, then go to uh, grab the ND. And then if you want to know more about the Web3 infrastructure, grab the HQ. And then if you want to be incubated by the, one of the top funds in, in Asia, talk to GD. Thank you. <laughs>